Okay, we're back. Thanks to your very kind response, I've decided to return with the second installment of The Mail is a Sacred Trust. Although I can't say that Price Waterhouse tallied up all your votes, it seems that enough of you weren't totally horrified by my literary experiment that you want to hear a bit more. You may be sorry that you asked, but I'll do my best to tell this story while attempting to master some of the intricacies involved with the technology necessary to convey it. Okay, as you may recall from our first installment, our narrator is remembering back to 1918 when he was a 10-year-old boy living in Oxford, Mississippi, and spotted a most peculiar sight. A young William Faulkner, recently discharged from the RAF, wearing his uniform and carrying a swagger stick as he walks across the Oxford Town Square with a pronounced, if not exactly bona fide, limp. All right, since this isn't Masterpiece Theater, and I'm not Alastair Cook, I'm going to keep the introduction short. The reading lasts about seven minutes and picks up where we left off with the boy and his father in Oxford, Mississippi. And now for the second installment of The Mail is a Sacred Trust. Oxford may have been the county seat, but we couldn't have been more than 2,500 Christian souls and probably a good deal less. Memphis was 40 miles north by train, New Orleans a quick trip down the Mississippi River. But we were nothing like those big cities. We were a small town in the poorest state in the nation. Everybody pretty much knew each other. We had no choice. The Confederacy was much in evidence in those days, for we were all proud people who held close to our roots. The town square, with its rebel soldier, was the center of our metropolis. Its courthouse made us honest, while its clock kept us punctual. There may not have been much to Oxford, but when Old Miss, otherwise known as the University of Mississippi, opened in 1848, it put us on the map. Chock full of stately buildings and old growth trees, the campus was one of the prettiest places a person could get schooled. And best of all, it was ours. Oxford may have been small, but she was fairly prosperous. You didn't have to go far outside of town, though, to see prosperity had its limits. The outskirts of Oxford were poor and rural, but the rich black soil grew cotton taller than a man on a horse, which kept many a family from starving. Farther out, where we lived, was lightly populated and covered in forest. It was here my daddy made a living harvesting timber. Nothing much ever happened in Oxford, which is why old Billy Faulkner stood out like a preacher in a cat house. Once, we had an invasion of walking catfish, which people still talk about. Nyla Creek, long since filled in, flooded after one especially wet spring, and the local fish population, for some reason known only to God, decided it was a good idea to make their way towards the courthouse. I was only a tadpole myself, but I can still remember the town square filled with so many fish, you'd think Jesus had performed a miracle. When the scorching sun finally broke through, you could smell those fish for miles. I can't say I knew much about Willie Faulkner, but seeing him as I did for the first time, combined with my father's reaction, somehow made me want to know more about this fella who acted like he knew something the rest of us didn't. Fortunately, I had a widowed aunt who lived in town, my mother's sister, who was fairly well off. She had a daughter, Amber, seven years older than me, who knew Billy from school. She was a pretty girl, if a bit too free with her opinions, but you could hardly blame her since she was reared at the feet of her gossiping mother. 
When my father and drop by to pay our respects that afternoon, we were invited to sit on their front porch and catch up. As we sipped iced tea and listened to the seat of our wicker chairs settle, it didn't take long till conversation turned to Billy. My ears perked up the moment my father mentioned his name. Saw Billy Faulkner today. The rhythm of my aunt's fan increased noticeably as she flapped against the afternoon air, which was thick enough to strangulate you. The advertisement on my aunt's fan, which I'd been trying to read, became so blurred from all that motion I finally gave up. He's a no-good layabout ne'er-do-well, my father said, and took a sip from his iced tea. Feel sorry for his parents, my aunt agreed, which surprised me since she wasn't a compassionate woman when it came to other folks' troubles. He's only brought shame upon them. My father nodded in earnest. What next unfolded was my aunt's detailed recollection of the Faulkner family's ancestry, business success, and social standing. I didn't understand half of what was said, but what I did get went something like this. Billy's great-grandfather, William Clark Faulkner, had been a lawyer, politician, Civil War colonel, railroad financier, and author of two books I'd never heard of. He was a larger-than-life individual, both personally and professionally, whose accomplishments overshadowed those of his descendants, much to their never-ending pride and regret. Billy's grandfather, John Wesley Thompson Faulkner, was called the young colonel to distinguish him from Billy's great-grandfather, the old colonel, even though he never fought in a war. But he did more than hold his own in terms of making money, even if he never quite attained the success of his father. In contrast, his son, Murray, who was Billy's father, had slid so far down the ancestral slope it was considered unseemly. My aunt knew Murray when he was working as a conductor on the old colonel's railroad. When the young colonel decided it was time to divest himself of his transportation holdings, Murray was greatly disappointed. Not only did he lose his position, which was supposed to be a sinecure, he lost his chance to inherit the family business. Now bear with me, I've just lost my place for a second. At the young colonel's urging, Murray moved his family to Oxford, where his father got him a job working for the First National Bank, which he owned, naturally. Billy was just five at the time, named after his great-grandfather with Cuthbert instead of Clark, his middle name. Billy was the first of four sons birthed to Murray and Maud Butler Faulkner. While it's true the young colonel was nearly as accomplished as his own father, Murray did not enjoy the same level of success. In fact, he would have done worse if it hadn't been for his father's help in hand, which my aunt praised since the young colonel was not a sentimental man. As it turned out, Billy Faulkner was as well-known in Oxford as his grandfather and great-grandfather. Unfortunately, it was for all the wrong reasons. If anything, he was even less promising than Murray. In fact, by the time I met Billy, he was considered a failure, and he was only 21. To be continued. <laughs>